Okay. Here, here we go. Here we go. Um, on the first day, God created the dog, and God said, sit all day with the door of your house and bark at anybody that comes by. I'm going to give you a lifespan of 20 years, and the dog said, that's too long to be barking. Give me 10 years, I'll give you back the other 10, and God agreed. So on the second day, God created the monkey. God said, entertain people, do monkey tricks, make them laugh. I'm going to give you a lifespan of 20 years. And the monkey said, how boring, monkey tricks for 20 years? I don't think so. The dog gave you back 10 years, that's what I'll do too, okay? God said, okay. On the third day, God created the cow. God said, you must go out in the field with the farmer all day long, suffer under the sun, have calves, give milk to support the farmer. I'm going to give you a lifespan of 60 years. The cow said, that's kind of a tough life. You want me to live for 60 years? Let me have 20. I'll give you back the other 40. God agreed. And then on the fourth day, God created man. God said, eat, sleep, play, marry, enjoy your life. I'll give you 20 years. Man said, what? Only 20 years? I'll tell you what, I'll take my 20, add the 40 the cow gave you back. 10, the monkey gave you back the 10, the dog gave you back, that makes 80. Okay, okay, God said, you've got a deal. So that was why the first 20 years of our lives, we eat, sleep, play, (laughs) marry, enjoy ourselves. For the next 40 years, we slave in the sun to support our family, trying to be an entrepreneur. For the next 10 years, we do monkey tricks to entertain the grandchildren. (laughs) For the last 10 years, we sit on the front porch and we bark at everybody that goes by. (laughs) We just had life explained to you. But we're we're going to talk about, you know, how how do you feed your your faith? And and in the the same, how how do you starve your doubts? Because it's so true, in the the tale of two wolves, the uh, Cherokee Indian He's telling his grandson that, that he said, there are two wolves within you, one bad, one good. And, and uh, the, the grandson looks at the, 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 the wise chief and, and, and asks him, uh, well, uh, which one is going to live within me? And he says, the one you feed. And it's very true. You, you can either feed your faith or you can feed your fears. I brought with me something I read the other day that I just love. And... Um, I want to pass it on to you. So just kind of sit and relax for a moment. Let me just read you this, this, I think, humorous story. A man in a hot air balloon realized that he was lost. He reduced altitude and spotted a woman below. He descended a bit more and he shouted, Excuse me, can you help me? I promised a friend that I would meet him an hour ago, but I don't know where I am. The woman below replied, You're in a hot air balloon. Hovering approximately 30 feet above the ground, you're between 40 and 41 degrees north latitude and between 59 and 60 degrees west longitude. You must be an engineer, said the balloonist. I am, replied the woman. How did you know? Well, answered the balloonist, everything you told me is technically correct, but I have no idea what to make of your information. And the fact is, I'm still lost. Frankly, You've not been much help at all. If anything, you've delayed my trip. The woman below responded, you must be in management. (laughs) You can see the train of coming, can't you? Said, you must be in management. I am, replied the balloonist, but how did you know? Well, said the woman, you don't know where you are or where you're going. You have risen to where you are due to a large quantity of hot air. (laughs) You made a promise which you have no idea how to keep, and you expect people beneath you to solve your problems. And the fact is, you are in exactly the same position you were in before we met, but now somehow, it's my fault. (laughs) I like this. It's entitled, In My Next Life. If you're a bear, you get to hibernate. You do nothing but sleep for six months. I could deal with that. Before you hibernate, you're supposed to eat yourself stupid. I could deal with that too. 
And if you're a bear, you birth your children who are the size of walnuts <laughs> while you're sleeping. <laughs> and you wake up to partially grown, cute, cuddly cubs. I can definitely deal with that. If you're a mama bear, everyone knows you mean business. You swat anyone who bothers your cubs. If your cubs get out of line, you swat them too. I could deal with that. I could deal with that. And if you're a bear, your mate expects you to, you to wake up growling. <laughs> he expects that you will have hairy legs. And he expects that you will have excess body fat. I could deal with that. I'm going to be a bear. I'm going to meditate on that good stuff, and I'm going to practice that good stuff. Now, the baloney story. Two guys having lunch, been working in the factory all day. He goes over, pulls out his lunch pail reaches in there, opens up the little package. It's a bologna sandwich. He is ticked. He looks at his buddy and he says, I have a bologna sandwich again today. This is the third time this week I have had a bologna sandwich in my lunch pail. I hate bologna sandwiches. Why is it that every day I reach into my lunch pail and I get another bologna sandwich? I don't like bologna. I hate bologna. Why in the world do I have to have a bologna sandwich? The guy's beside me say, hey, guy, relax. Come on, calm down. Take a pill. It's okay. It's okay. Listen, go home tonight and tell your wife you don't want a bologna. Leave my wife out of it. I fix my own lunch. I fix my own lunch. Most of the baloney we have in life, we packed in our own pail. We did it. Oh, I've got something I've got to read you. This is so fun. I brought this. I just found this the other day. This is the story of the parrot and the turkey. This is laminated. <sighs> a young man named John received a parrot as a gift, and the parrot had a bad attitude and even worse vocabulary, and every word out of the bird's mouth was rude, obnoxious, or laced with profanity. John tried and tried to change the bird's attitude by consistently saying only polite words, playing soft music, anything he thought could kind of clean up the bird's vocabulary, and finally John was fed up. He yelled at the parrot, the parrot yelled back. John shook the parrot. The parrot got angrier and even more rude. And John, in desperation, threw up his hand, grabbed the bird, and put him in the freezer. <laughs> For a few minutes, the parrot squawked and kicked and screamed and cussed. Then suddenly, everything got real quiet. Not a peep was heard for over a minute. Fearing that he'd hurt the parrot, John quickly opened the door of the freezer. And the parrot calmly stepped out to John's outstretched arms and said, I believe I may have offended you with my rude language and actions. I'm sincerely remorseful for my inappropriate transgressions, and I fully intend to do everything I can to correct my rude and unforgivable behavior. <laughs> John was stunned at the change of the bird's attitude, and he was about to ask the parrot what had made such a dramatic change in the freezer and the behavior, and the bird spoke up very softly. May I ask what the turkey did? <laughs> find it. I brought with me something that just probably illustrates the value of equipping as, as good as anything. It's, um, it's a story of a bricklayer. This bricklayer uh, tried to move 500 pounds of bricks from the top of a four-story building to the sidewalk below, okay? The problem is he tried to do it all by himself. And what I have here in my hands are his words, his exact words, that were taken from his insurance claim form. Here's what he said. It would have taken too long to carry the bricks down by hand, so I decided to put them in a barrel and lower them by a pulley, which I had fastened to the top of the building. 
So after tying the rope securely at ground level, I went up to the top of the building. I fashioned the rope around the barrel, loaded it with the bricks, and then I swung it over the sidewalk for the descent. I then went down to the sidewalk and I untied the rope. holding it securely to guide the barrel down slowly. But since I weigh only 140 pounds, the 500 pound load jerked me from the ground so fast that I didn't have time to think of letting go of the rope. As I passed between the second and third floor, I met the barrel coming down. This accounts for the bruises and the lacerations on my upper body. I held tightly to the rope until I reached the top where my hand became jammed in the pulley. This accounts for my broken thumb. At this time, however, the barrel hit the sidewalk with a bang and the bottom fell out. With the weight of the bricks gone, the barrel weighed only 40 pounds. <sighs> You're good, aren't you? Thus my 140 pound body began a swift descent and I met the empty barrel coming up. This accounts for my broken ankle. Slowed only slightly, I continued the descent and I landed on the pile of brick. This accounts for my sprained back and broken collarbone. And I love this next statement. At this point, I lost my presence of mind completely. I'd like to debate that. He said, at this point, I lost my presence of mind completely and I let go of the rope. And the empty barrel came crashing down on me. This accounts for my head injuries. And as for the last question on your insurance claim form, what would I do if the same situation arose again? Please be assured that I'm finished trying to do the job all by myself. Pretty soon they began to shrink away from life itself. One more laminated card. This is, a, this is the diary of a dog. Here are the excerpts from the dog's diary. 8 a.m., dog food, my favorite thing. 9.30, a car ride, my favorite thing. 9.40, a walk in the park, my favorite thing. 10.30, got rubbed and petted, oh, Oh, my favorite thing. 12 p.m. lunch, my favorite thing. 1 p.m. played ball in the yard, my favorite thing. 3 p.m. wagtail, my favorite thing. 5 p.m. milk bones, my favorite thing. 7 p.m. got to play ball again, my favorite thing. 8 p.m. wow, watch TV with the people. <laughs> my favorite thing. 11 p.m. sleeping on the Bad, my favorite thing. These are the excerpts of a cat's diary. <laughs> I see the train a coming. Day 983 of my captivity. My captors continued to taunt me with bizarre little dangling objects. <laughs> the only thing that keeps me going is my dream of escape. <laughs> Her story this week about a lady who, who bought a parrot at a store and she was kind of lonely so she wanted a parrot to kind of take home to talk to her so she took the parrot home and sat there and you know, the parrot in the cage and the parrot didn't say a word. 
Next day she went to the store and said, the parrot doesn't talk. Well, the, the manager of the store said, that, well, you know, maybe you need to get a ladder for the cage because parrots like to climb and, and get exercise. And so she got a ladder, put it in the cage and sat there and watched the parrot. And didn't talk. So the next day she went back to the store and said, yeah, I got the ladder, the parrot doesn't talk. He said, you, you, you probably need a swing. Par parrots, parrots like to swing and just kind of go back and forth a little bit and puts them in a good mood. So she got a swing, put it in the cage, went back home and, you know, sat there and watched the parrot and the parrot didn't talk. And she went back to the store the next day she knew that, you know, got the swing, got the ladder, the parrot still doesn't talk. He said, well, you, you, you need a mirror. Parrot likes to look at himself and get a mirror in there. And that, that'll help. So she went, got a mirror and put it in there. And the parrot just look at itself and swing and climb. <laughs> she came back to the manager the next day. And she said, the parrot died. <laughs> she said, the parrot died? Oh, how terrible. He said, did the parrot say anything before he died? <laughs> yeah, I said, the parrot says, don't they sell food down there? I'm hungry. I'm hungry. I know all kinds of people in their spiritual life. They got ladders. They got mirrors. They got swings. They got stuff. And they don't understand. They don't understand that less is more. That, that what you've got to do is go for the simple. Go for the, go for the true. Go, go for the food for your own soul. For your spiritual life. Now, now, let me give you another example. Number two, who you are determines how you see others. It's like, it's like two men who came in on separate occasions during the day to a hardware store. They were both moving to the same town. And the guy that owned the hardware store, the guy walked in and he said, look, I'm just moving to the town. I got a question to ask you. He said, how are the people in this town? Are they friendly? Are they, are they warm? And the guy that owned the hardware store, very wise, said, well, let me ask you a question. How were the people in the town that you just left? He said, well, they weren't very friendly at all. In fact, we're so excited about moving because we're hoping that the people are friendlier here. And the guy in the hardware store said, I'm, I'm just sorry to say this because this is going to disappoint you. The, the people aren't real friendly here either. A couple hours later in the same hardware store, another guy moved, came in and he said, we're just moving to the town. I've got a question to ask you. How, how are the people in this town? Well, the hardware store said, let me ask you a question. How were the people in the town that you just left? Oh, he said, we just hated to leave the town. We loved everybody. The people were so friendly. They were so cooperative. We had great neighbors. And the hardware owner, he smiled. He said, I've got great news for you. The people in this town are just the same way. You see, there are people that have destination disease. They just think if they can just move somewhere or meet someone or do this or go there, that all of a sudden their life will change. That's why I love the expression. I love this expression. No matter where you are, there you are. 